Dr Wolford, before we then look at the submission that went to ministers on the topic of commercial involvement, um, there's just chronologically one further document um, from this period I want to ask you to look at. It's DHSC 302199 underscore 055. And it's a minute from Dr Oliver to you, um, copied to Mr Wormald, dated the 30th of September 1980. It says, on the question of self-sufficiency of products for the treatment of haemophilia, I've had an informal talk with Dr. Tubby. As I understand the position, it's unlikely that we could ever become self-sufficient for factor VIII to treat all haemophiliacs. However, self-sufficiency could be achieved if there were an accepted policy by those treating haemophilia to treat most haemophiliacs with cryoprecipitate and reserve purified factor VIII for, say, 20% of cases needing special treatment, e.g. for surgery, etc. Other countries apparently do this successfully. Though less easy to give than purified factor VIII, cryoprecipitate is seemingly clinically acceptable. If all this is true and the policy were accepted, it could have a significant impact on the need for imported plasma and the BPL development and could perhaps tide us over until factor VIII was genetically engineered. And then if we look at the handwriting towards... The, and the, sorry, or have I got it all wrong? And then if we look at the handwriting towards the bottom of the page, um, someone has put a note... And how do we persuade clinicians to use cryoprecipitate? Question mark exclamation mark. Um, and then someone else has said, "Let us await Dr. Wolford's reply." And then bottom of the page, checked with Dr. Wolford's P PA, thirteenth mm -hmm. of October. Dr. Wolford has not yet replied to Dr. Oliver's minute. Um, now, Dr. Wolford, we haven't as as yet at least traced a reply that doesn't mean there wasn't one because there are other documents we've been mm. unable to trace from this time. Can you recall this exchange and, and your reply? No, I don't recall it at all, but probably I spoke to Dr Oliver. He was my boss. We uh, got on extremely well. I was often talking to him. I may well have replied to him. This is interesting because Dr Tubby is there talking to Dr Oliver. Once again, he isn't talking to me. Uh, it's the way he operated within a hierarchy... But the interesting thing about it, I suppose, is that actually Dr. Tuffy was part of the Gunson Working Party on Plasma Supplies, which were reported in 1981 and absolutely uh, was talking about 80% um, of intermediate factor VIII being the product that, that was wanted. I think he had also advised on the earlier Trends Working Party. So this was, as it were, a new concept coming through from him it's perfectly reasonable for him to have thought that but essentially uh, he doesn't seem to have said the same thing in any of the more formal working parties that he could have he could have proposed that that was the thing to do um, now this might not have been a com complete magic solution to, to, mm. to, to, to <clears throat> self-sufficiency or BPL but would you agree that it, it it was an idea worth considering further and, and perhaps worth talking to, say, haemophilia clinicians about. I think we had to decide, or it had to be decided, if you made a lot more cryoprecipitate um, at regional transfusion centres, then, of course, there was very much less plasma. Uh, the problem was really there was not enough plasma to do whatever it was you wanted to do. So if you wanted to make more factor eight, there wasn't at the time enough plasma. If you made more cryoprecipitate, of course, that deprived BPL of the plasma. There's another issue about making, trying to get as close to self-sufficiency or at least making much more cryo than, than making concentrate. And this is a matter which is very clearly spelled out by Dr. Lane, <clears throat> the cryoprecipitate supernatant needed was, was the material that was needed to then go on to fractionation for all the other products that BPL had to produce. So if, in fact, you ended up making an awful lot of cryoprecipitate in regional transfusion centers, you had to devise a really quite complicated system of taking off the supernatant, that is the fluid which is left after you've centrifuged the plasma which is then taken, needs to go to BPL in order to make albumin, in order to make factor nine, 
which is needed every bit as much for a severe Christmas disease or um, haemophilia B patient as is needed for uh, factor VIII as is needed for severe haemophilia A. So there were significant downsides to retaining plasma at the regional transfusion centers in any large amounts because this starting material for all these other products, albumin, immunoglobulin, factor IX, had somehow to find its way to BPL. And the regional transfusion centers were simply not set up to do some kind of sterile collection of this material um, in bulk to go to, to BPL. I think making more cryoprecipitate for the treatment of mild haemophilia is a perfectly valid concept. So maybe increase the amount of cryoprecipitate at this point that you're thinking that you should do. But bearing in mind that for all the cryoprecipitate that you make and retain at, at the blood transfusion centers, you are reducing the amount of plasma that can go to BPL. And at the time, the decision was taken by the, work, the various working parties that were involved in what was the product that was needed, and it was intermediate factor eight, which had to be done at BPL. You, you've identified potential disadvantage or disadvantages to um, increasing the production of cryoprecipitate at regional transfusion centres. But that would have to be balanced against a potential advantage, which is the advantage of viral safety. Yes. Um, um, so I mean, would you agree that although there might have been further down the line issues that would need to be explored if it was to be taken any further, it's somewhat surprising that the, it doesn't appear to have gone any further. There's no considered discussion of this particular proposal that, that seems to take place in any of the various working parties, committees, groups, and so on um, in, in the autumn of 1980 mm. or, or later. Well, it seems to me that actually Dr. Tavi was in a prime position, in almost pole position to take it forward if he had chosen to. I haven't found anything in the papers in any of the... Um, in any of the uh, regional transfusion service or haemophilia centre directors' papers that Dr. Tubby ever pronounced in this way, uh, he could have done. It was certainly open to him to have uh, actually suggested that if he thought it was the appropriate thing to do. And what would have been the ideal forum for that to be explored further? the regional transfusion directors together with the haemophilia centre directors? That, I think that would be a very good forum. Um, could, could we just check the date of this one, It's please? the 30th of September, 1980. If we just look, that's it. So it was Dr. Gunson's working party, I think was set up in February, 81, to look at plasma supplies. And Dr. Tubby was one of the advisors to that working party. So that would have been exactly a, a, a prime... Um, a prime forum, if you like, for him to make this um, make this suggestion. I, I haven't seen from the papers that he did. Um, if we then again pick up the thread then of the issue about BPL's redevelopment uh, and go to WITN. No, sorry, that's the wrong reference. Um, if we go to DHSC zero 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 two three zero seven underscore zero six nine. And this is a minute from uh, Mr. Wormald to Mr. Nodder and to Dr. Harris, so it's and to Mr. Knight. So it's going to the ministerial private offices and to the deputy chief medical officer, is that right? That's right. Um, it's dated the 14th of November, 1980. Um, we can see he refers in paragraph one to attaching a submission. Um, uh, um, long and complex um, but the issue is a complex one and then paragraph two he says I should point out that the submission directs itself to the issue of whether or not Beecham it does not deal fully with other issues which will need further consideration if the answer to Beecham is negative negative. and then he sets out uh, um, uh, some weaknesses of the present arrangements I'm not going to go through the detail of that under the heading plasma supply uh, in paragraph six, he essentially, I think, says words to similar effect to what we saw in your memo of the 15th of September, um, picking it up five lines down, all our advisors, not only those from the NBTS itself, but those from industry and academia, believe that commercialization would make it difficult to increase our plasma supply from voluntary sources or even to maintain it. 
I agree that this is a major risk, and he talks about the possibility of losing a substantial number of donors. And then if we go over the page, we can see there is a heading summary. He sets out the major advantages of an arrangement with Beecham, provision of commercial management expertise, transfer of technological risk, short-term expediency of their putting up the capital for redevelopment and speed, and then the main disadvantages, the risk to the voluntary donor programme, um, and implications if plasma supply contracts contracts or cannot be expanded, the associated issue of commercialisation of blood, the health and ethical problems relating to the import and export of plasma and products. Would it be right to understand the health problems as referring to the risks, increased risk of hepatitis? Yes. Um, and then the possibility the company could exploit their monopoly position to impose higher costs on the NHS. There's reference then to strong opposition, um, um, which the proposal would undoubtedly um, arouse uh, and he refers to um, being particularly impressed by the fact that none even of our outside advisors including Dr Dunhill who's acted as a consultant for many firms including Beecham favour the proposal on balance and we know of course Mr Smart was strongly opposed to it um, and then uh, if we go further down the page the heading recommendation um, he says, I've involved myself closely in the discussions leading up to this submission, both with Beecham and with our advisors have given it much thought over a prolonged period. The advantages and disadvantages are substantial, and I foresee continuing problems of both investment and management if we re retain BPL within the NHS. Um, the Beecham proposals are at this stage helpful and reasonable. From the point of view of fractionation, pure and simple, I would advocate Beecham. Nevertheless, my conclusion is that why did disadvantages outweigh the advantages? and in particular the likely impact on the donor programme and possibly on the whole voluntary donor principle is too substantial to incur. And then paragraph 12, he says, I think it's important we should reach a decision in principle now. That is, we should either reject the commercial option or decide that we intend to implement it subject to satisfactory negotiations. A decision merely to continue negotiations without commitment in principle would prolong uncertainty, encourage continued argument and further damage morale at BPL, and it would not be fair to... Beecham, and then a number of decisions set out on the top of the next page. Do we enter into detailed negotiations with Beecham, and if so, on what basis? Do we abandon discussion and instead formulate plans to redevelop BPO with public funds? And then D, should we explore other possibilities, e.g. the Red Cross and NEB? That's the National Enterprise Board, is it? Yes. Um, um, even though there's no present indication that they'll be able to help us. So, um, uh, um, and then we can see reference in paragraph 14 to the forthcoming Granada programme. That's a Granada TV programme. I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, so that, that's the memo which sets out Mr Wormald's views in summary form. We can take, I think, the submission, therefore, shortly, but I, I will put it up on screen. It's DHSC 30 underscore 070. So we can pick it up in paragraph two. Um, it refers to the Minister of State having authorised the short-term upgrading of BPL and officials being asked to explore the possibility of a British pharmaceutical company rebuilding facilities, manufacturing the blood products. Uh, this paper reports on our discussions with industry and seeks decisions on the proposals made by Beecham Pharmaceuticals Limited. Um, and then if we go over the page, um, paragraph eight, um, uh, but, sorry, if we pick up the last sentence of paragraph 7, Beecham would have the option to terminate the contract and either get out of the business altogether or set up in business as a commercial supplier of blood products. There is little doubt that the latter is their long-term aim. It seems clear in our discussions with them that their objective is similar to that of foreign companies which have approached the department, namely to set up a factory in the south of England to import blood plasma and export blood products. Um, there's then a discussion about various considerations. If we go to the Bottom of the next page, we see the risk of hepatitis there being spelt out in paragraph 13. Um, and then if we go over um, to page 7, please, um, we can see um, it's set out in paragraph 20A, we don't know Beecham's objectives. We believe their chief object is to get into the international blood product market. Um, and then if we look towards the bottom of the page, 
it said um, against Beecham, it's likely they want the NHS primarily to lean on. Learn, learn on. Learn on, sorry. Um, they may not see it as the top priority Freudian slip there for their attention once they develop <laughs> a wider business. Um, uh, and then they have a reputation for being very hard-nosed. Medicines division have a low opinion of them as meeting only minimum manufacturing standards. And then over the page, it said none of this amounts to good reasons for not using them, um, subject to negotiating satisfactory terms. They probably represent as good a commercial breath as we're likely to get. And then the options set out similar to in, in the, the, the memo. Um, so this is... Um, uh, November of 1980. So essentially, it's it's taken to to the tail end of 1980 to get to the point where ministers are being asked just to make the in principle decision: do we go further with Beecham or not? Yep. Do, do do you have any ob observations about that time scale, Dr. Wolford? My observation is the same as the. My observations about the entire time scale, it was very protracted, unnecessarily so, in my view. And then we can see, if we look at HCDO 40394 underscore 052, a press release... Um, which records the minister's decision that, that there is also a, um, a, a written parliamentary um, question and, and answer. But um, this is 26th of November 1980. No commercial management of blood products laboratory. Modernisation programme already underway, says Dr Vaughan. And then if we look towards the bottom of the page, um, we can see... Uh, the penultimate paragraph, there have been rumours we intend to hand the laboratory over to a commercial company to run... This is not so. We thought it only right to examine a number of different ways of developing the laboratory, including possibly bringing in commercial management, but we've decided against it. this. So two points, Dr. Wolford. First of all, this is a public communication of the minister's decision, essentially an answer to Mr. Wormald's question. Um, don't, don't take discussions further with Beecham, is that right? Yes. Um, but secondly, is it right to understand... Um, or is it right to say that it was not the case that the department was exploring handing over the laboratory to a commercial company to run? As, as one reads this, which was obviously written by the press office but with ministerial sanction, that's what they are saying. I think we've seen otherwise looking at the papers. So it, it's... Um, it's not. It's not an entirely accurate characterisation of what's been. It's. It's. It's decidedly not accurate. Um, I, I don't know whether you would know the answer to this, but it's a question I've been asked by some to raise with you. Um, do you know whether, and we've seen reference to it, the, the forthcoming Granada TV World in Action program? Mm was what caused the minister to take a different view? The issue for me is that I don't know what that programme was. I don't even know if I saw it or whether I may have seen it subsequently. I simply don't know what that programme was, uh, but it, it might have been something which accelerated a, a, a ministerial decision, if you like, but I don't know what the programme actually was about. Don't, don't, don't worry, we'll, we'll be looking at that programme uh, in, again, I think, in later hearings. Um, Would you, just standing back now, as it were, with the helicopter overview that you, you referred to um, uh, earlier, Dr. Wolfert, um, was it a mistake for the department to embark upon what turned out to be a fairly prolonged investigation of this commercial option in circumstances where Mr. Smart, Dr. Dunnell, Dr. Lane, others were firmly of the view that it was unrealistic and that the right way to proceed was through redevelopment as an NHS facility. I think the only reason, really, in my, in my view, of involving uh, any form of commercial um, enterprise was to see if they would 
run it under contract or provide the commercial management nous, if you like, to, to, run, to run it and then potentially help to um, put in, in place plans for a, for a whole new build. But essentially to keep it within the NHS but, but with a, a much bigger infusion of commercial expertise, if you will, because that's what it absolutely desperately needed. Uh, so from, from my, from my, um, in, in my view, that's really the only commercial side of things that one really needed to consider. Um, I think that there was, uh, the, your question was, was it, was it the wrong thing to have, could you just re rephrase Was it a mistake? Question? given everything that was being said by Smart, mm. Lane, yeah. Dunnell, etc., yeah. yes. to embark upon this, thi yes. this particular yeah. prolonged investigation? Yes. Uh, personally, I think it was a mistake. Um, and and it, it's right to note, is it not, and relevant to note in that regard, m Mr Smart had made it clear from the outset that there were no British companies yes. with fractionation experience. Yes. Well, Beecham's wasn't a fractionator, so it was going to bring in commercial pharmaceutical expertise, but I think it was going to be relying on BPL to provide the fractionation expertise. And on any view, would you agree, in light of your earlier answers, that it took too long to get to this point? It took too long. Um, if we then look at um, WITN 44610046, this is really just to <coughs> complete the picture for 1980. Yeah, WITN 44610046 is the reference I've got, but that might be a different one. No, let me just see whether there's another reference. No, I'm just going to turn to the Bureau of Documentary Reference. What I might do, it's very short, is read it out because um, mm -hmm. it's really just, it's one, one paragraph. I'll tell you what it is and, if, and then if, if we can get it on screen under a different reference, we'll, we'll do so. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a memo, a minute from Mr Knight, so the Minister's private office, to Mr Harley, dated the 8th of January 1981, and it says, this minute confirms that when you and Messrs Wormald, Hart and Belitho met MSH, so the Minister, mm -hmm. and PSH, the Parliamentary Under Secretary, mm -hmm. on the 17th of December, mm -hmm. Ministers asked that planning and design should begin on the redevelopment scheme at the Blood Products Laboratory. Yes. So the p purpose in, in reading that out, and we'll find the reference at least for the transcript, and I know it's, it's one of the documents you refer to in your statement, um, is just to show that the point in time at which we reach at the end of 1980 is there's a decision now well over 18 months after the medicines inspection report to begin the process of yes. planning. And, yes. and that is, I think to use a word that you've used on more than one occasion in your evidence already, an unconscionable period of time. Yes. Um, can I then pick matters up in April of 1981? DHSC 0002315 underscore zero four nine. Um, so this is again Mr. Wormald to Mr. Knight, 10th of April 1981. Um, and paragraph two, it is widely known following the very unfavorable medicines division report that the government intend to redevelop BPL. The minister made this clear in his World in Action interview earlier in the year. We have never, however, committed ourselves to a particular timetable, nor decided how much of the laboratory will be rebuilt. Um, and then um, he um, goes on to um, set out various considerations that, that need to be considered. So is it right to understand, Dr. Wolfe, that now two years on from the medicines inspection report, there's still no timetable and no decision? Is it going to be a completely new building? Is it going to be using part of the existing building and, and developing that? Yes. Um, and then 
um, if we go to DHSC 302309 underscore 004, This is now the 18th of June, 1981. The date's at the bottom of the page. It's from Mr. Wormald to Mr. Knight again. And I just wanted to ask if you can assist us with understanding the first paragraph. Secretary of State has now agreed that RHA capital allocations will, if mm. necessary, be top-sliced to pay for the redevelopment of BPL. This enables us to proceed with detailed planning. And, and then it talks about some of the aspects of, of, of planning that will need to be considered. What's the reference to top slicing the, the RHA allocations? Well, the RHA allocations, it was sort of programmatic allocate, allocations, so each regional health authority had its allocation. It was really up to uh, government, it's up to the um, ministers to decide whether or not they decided to, to cut the, the allocations across the board to regions or in some differential fashion, depending on, on their view, um, in order to pay for the redevelopment. So essentially, it's wrong to say robbing Peter to pay Paul, but essentially not putting so much money out into the NHS, but actually keeping some back to redevelop BPL. So um, um, would it be right to understand this as, as uh, ha having th this consequence that ministers were not at this point envisaging finding new money. more money or new money. No. They were going to take the existing allocations to regional yes. health authorities and essentially keep back some yes. of that. Yes. Do you know why, given if that was an obvious solution, it wasn't considered at any earlier stage? I, I know that wasn't part of your main remit. Oh, I think it was a very unpopular thing for ministers to do. They, 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 they never really wanted to do that because obviously what the regions would then say is well we've planned you're not giving us enough money you're really going to have to increase the amount of money but I think it's fair in all fairness to say this was probably the hardest time financially that you can conceivably imagine for the NHS it was in in the sort of teeth of having been a recession very uh, you know very recent recession the amount of money that was available in terms of percentage of GDP, as I've spelt out in my, in my um, statement, was tiny. And essentially, really and truly, that there was not enough money to go around and the Treasury um, was, was very strict in controlling the, the uh, purse strings. So ministers might have tried, for all I know, uh, to approach their Treasury colleagues, but, but essentially it was looks as if it didn't work anyway, even if they did try. And that's what they found the solution, was to actually reduce the money going to the NHS. Now, um, if we look at WITN 4461048... What we can see here is a submission to ministers asking for them to agree to the setting up of a um, what became, I think, the policy steering group for the redevelopment of BPL. Mm -hmm. um, why was ministerial approval required for what would not even now the establishment of a new group, but just the mm -hmm. formation of a subcommittee? I don't really know actually, because that shouldn't, I don't think, normally have required ministerial approval. No, I really don't know. And if we look at then at page 11, I think it is, of this bundle, of, of this document, um, we can see a, a, a letter, um, this is uh, from the previous year, May of 1980, from Mr Dunnill, but I just want to draw attention to one bit of it that you refer to in your statement, um, if we go further down the page, um, it's, yes, it's paragraph three. Um, uh, Medicines Division recommendations follow a series of recommended short-term expedients designed to boost production by tinkering with the present inadequate plant. This has created a trail of overlapping and confused initiatives which are made more difficult to implement by the inevitably slow process of funding in the ministry. Um, uh, do you disagree with the observation Dr Dunnell was making there? Well, as I said, I spelt out in my statement, I was in agreement 
uh, fully with what Dr. Dunnell was saying. It had been a totally chaotic, protracted, and difficult process, uh, and needlessly so, in my view. And in your statement, you... I think that's it. Um, I, 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 it's just one sentence, so I'll just read it out. You, you, you refer to that. You say it seems to me to be a good summation of the situation. I do remember, too, my own frustration about innumerable and repetitive meetings, which generally ended without moving matters forward to any appreciable extent. Yeah. And it's right to say I'm really taking you to the documents to sh where the, the, the points in time where things do move forward. Mm. You've reviewed a much larger number of documents, many of which re are referred to in your statement, which we're not looking at, yes. which show meeting after meeting after meeting. Exactly so. Um, now, the policy steering group, I, I don't need to go to it, just, just to give us a, a date, though, met for the first time on the 24th of August, 1981, and you were part of that, yes. that group. Um, but if we then pick the picture up in a document at DHSC 0020710 underscore 056... We can see a minute from Dr. Harris to Mr. Harley. I just wanted to ask you about the last paragraph. Um, he refers to the policy steering group commissioning a feasibility study. And then he says this, as I've already mentioned in an earlier note after my discussion with Lord Elton, the group must give consideration to the use of an existing factory which could be adapted at relatively low cost to the requirements of a new BPL rather than devote a lot of time to designing a new building from the outset. Now, this is the 13th of October, 1981. So we're now a good 10 months or so further on um, from, um, 11 months further on, from the, the minister's decision not to go with the Beecham proposal. Yes. Um, uh, at this point in time, it would appear there's still no decision, in, even in principle, to a rebuilding a new facility. And, and your group, or sorry, the policy steering group, yes. which you will remember, is being asked to explore the yes. possibility of adapting the existing buildings. Is that right? Yes. I had to um, look up uh, who Lord Elton was, I'm afraid, uh, when I was coming to look at the various papers. I think um, he came before Lord uh, Glen Arthur as, uh, as the uh, parliamentary secretary in the Lords, who presumably therefore had the blood uh, transfusion brief, I'm not entirely sure, but he was, I think, only in the department for about six months, and yet, somehow, after everything that had happened, there was a need then to consider and spend time considering, could we find some other building instead of rebuilding? And in point of fact, officials did spend time looking at that, and, and there were no such buildings. But well, as I had a different boss in a different life who used to say, order, counter order, disorder. And that's effectively what we were getting. Because by this time, what we've, what we've got is, are a seri leaving aside the, 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 the short term measures, that are, the interim measures that are being funded, um, we've got decisions about what not to do, mm -hmm. but we still haven't got a decision as to what is going to be done longer term. Yes. Um, and if we then, in, in that same month, October 1981, um, then go to DHSC 0002211 underscore 063. This is a meeting of the, um, the Joint Management Committee for the Central Blood Laboratory. <coughs> We've been looking mostly at the Scientific and Technical Committee meetings. Um, but this is the JMC, 23rd of October um, um, and it, it is 1981. Um, if we go to the second page, um, I think we, we get a sense of the committee's frustrations. So if we look um, at paragraph nine under the heading long-term management arrangements, um, Mr. Godfrey reported that ministers were still considering the management structure for the central blood laboratories. The importance of an early decision had been emphasized by officials the committee stressed the difficulties that would occur if the matter were not decided before the completion of the proposed feasibility study on redevelopment. 
Now, management in, in the long term is a, was a slightly different issue from the redevelopment of yes. the facility, but we can see there what's being suggested by the committee is that you can't do one without the other. Is that right? You certainly needed some way of managing this very major project. Well, this isn't, I think, um, just management of the project, is it? It's management of, of the central blood laboratories themselves. Yes, but actually also the coordination, if you like, with the NBTS. And then if we go to the next page, we, we can see uh, um, at the top of the heading policy steering group on the redevelopment of BPL, a report by Mr Smart. Mr Smart reported that the group had agreed to meet as and when necessary, had done so three times to date. Its work was hampered to an extent by the lack of ministerial decision on long-term management arrangements. So it would appear that is holding up the, the planning that, that the policy steering group can do. Is that right? Yes. Um, th there was a further ministerial visit to BPL in January of 1982. Do you, I can't remember without checking which minister it was, but do you recall whether you went on that? I don't remember. I might have done, but I don't. See, I was in and out of BPL, so the trouble is I just don't remember particular visits. Um, and then um, if we look at DHSC 000. 000 2215 underscore 087. Um, this is a meeting of the policy steering group, 1st of March 1982. Now, you weren't, in fact, in attendance at this meeting. Um, but it's just um, to note, if we go to page 2, paragraph 6... There's reference there to a, a report from Liberton, and I'm, I'm going to come on to the, the Liberton issue and, 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 and the um, uh, shift working trial. Um, but we can see the last two sentences of that paragraph. Mr Harley was asked to seek JMC, that's the Joint Management mm -hmm. Committee approval, for planning to proceed on the assumption that BPL would process all plasma for England and Wales. The estimated production capacity of the new laboratory could be revised if necessary at a later date if there were a substantial change in Liberton's position. So the point we've reached by March of 1982 is we're going to plan on an assumption that we can't use the, the Scottish fractionation yeah. resource. Now, you were then on maternity leave April to October 1982, I think. Yes. Um, so I, I'm not going to ask you about what was or wasn't happening in, in, in that period of time. Um, but I, I, I am going to ask you to look at a submission to ministers which went in September of 1982, which was copied to you, possibly in anticipation of your return from maternity mm -hmm. leave. Um, so it's DHSC 0002309 underscore 017. Um, if we look at the bottom of the page, we can see it's from Mr. Godfrey. It's the 22nd of September, 1982. And we can see it's copied to a number of people, including um, you. And then if we go to the top of the page, paragraph one, uh, it says, in April 1981, ministers agreed a policy steering group should begin planning the redevelopment of the blood products laboratory and that health authorities' allocation should be reduced. So that's the top slicing. Um, redevelopment has been approved in principle by the Treasury, who've also agreed that the project should be fast-tracked. <coughs> um, yes, I was going to make no comment on that. Um, Two, the steering group have now reached the stage at which ministerial decisions are required on size, scale of production and cost. And then there's reference to an attached paper, as I say, I'm, because you weren't involved in putting mm. it together, I'm not going to ask you about that. Um, um, but if we then um, look at paragraph five, it says the paper concludes by seeking minister's approval to submit a stage two submission um, to the Treasury, and then there's reference to it, um, uh, the matter being put forward for information to, to Scottish ministers. So um, it's really just to complete the, the mm. timetable, as it were, on, on this issue. September 1982, bearing in mind we've really started with the present purposes with the Medicines Inspection Report in April of 1979. Mm -hmm. We have taken till now to get the stage where decisions actual concrete decisions on size, scale and cost are, are even being sought from ministers? Yes. I think, though, it's probably fair to say that uh, 
there had been some involvement of a, of a commercial company, Norketon um, Hall, or I forget its name precisely, to do a feasibility study, to, to look at more detail. I don't think it was total stasis. Uh, I think that there was work going on, which the Joint Management Committee had actually commissioned, or the, or the steering group had commissioned, to, to get some design input. Or yes, yes. No, you're, no, you're absolutely right. There were things mm. happening to get to that stage. Mm. But again, it's the, really, it's the overall period yes. of time. Yes. Again, would you accept, using your own word earlier, unconscionable? Yes. Um, and, and then we can see um, DHSC 2309 underscore 019. Um, uh, this is meeting on the 7th of October 1982. Again, you're, you're not present, although you're copied into it. Um, but we can see um, a reference to Mr Finsberg, so that's the minister agreeing that the investment appraisal should go forward to the Treasury. Um, so that's, that, that's, as it were, the next stage. Um, we then, in terms of your own involvement... Um, have and I'm not going to put it on screen because there's nothing in the detailed content of it I want to ask you about but there's a meeting of the joint management committee attended by you on the 5th of October 1982 so you're now back from maternity yes. leave um your recollection set out in your statement is that you then didn't have any significant ongoing involvement in in relation to the redevelopment of BPL is, is that right that's right, because the, the Central Blood Laboratories Authority then took over from the Joint Management Committee, and as you will have seen from the various papers, basically I was not entitled to attend those meetings, although uh, it was said that I might be given permission, if necessary, to attend, but I was not involved at all in their meetings. So that leads me on to the next uh, so subtopic, which was about the establishment of the, the Central Blood Laboratories Authority. We know, and your statement sets it out for us, that that was established on the 1st of December 1982 as a special health authority, so as a specific legal entity. Yes. With responsibility for the management of BPL, the PFL in Oxford, mm -hmm. and the Blood Reference Group. Blood, blood Group, group Reference, reference Laboratory. Laboratory. Yes. Um, I know I think again your statement says you weren't closely involved with its mm. establishment but there are just two or three documents I'd like to look at with you to see whether you can cast any light on them uh, the first is DHSC three zeros two three zero seven underscore zero three four um, now this is a minute from Mr. Wormald to Mr. Nodder, um, uh, dated the 6th of April 1981. Um, and and uh, it, it deals in part with BPL, but I'm, I'm not going to ask you about that. If we go to the second page, we can see there's a heading, Future Management of Central Blood Laboratories. The present arrangements were set up for the short term and pose many problems. All concerned are agreed they cannot continue. Uh, for simplicity, this minute assumes that BPL, PFL and BGRL will continue under the same management. We've considered many possibilities. Really, there are only three runners, management by a health authority, management by an enlarged and reconstituted public health laboratory service and a special health authority. It's referred to a discussion at a meeting. Our conclusion was that a special health authority was the clear first choice. Um, and then... Uh, if we look at paragraph 10, um, the first point to make is that the laboratories, or at any rate the BPL, could not be run properly by the ordinary regional health authority and RTO. What, what's that acronym for? RTO structure? Uh, I'm trying to find the bit in the... Um, I'm so sorry. It's the second line of paragraph 10. My apologies. Oh, right. Uh, regional treasurers, I imagine. I'm not sure. Not quite sure. Okay, thank you. Um, BPL is a large, complex and highly specialised factory operation which needs much special expertise in our view at board as well as management level. And then that's further discussed. Uh, and then paragraph 12, it says, we envisage that the members or at any event the chairman would exercise considerable oversight over the management, and I understand that to be referring to the management of BPL, which does not and cannot possess all the necessary skills and is to boot a little idiosyncratic. Do, do you know... Who or what was being described there as idiosyncratic? 
I'm just trying to follow. I'm so sorry. I'm I, sorry I, I did, I've talking. got it. I've got paragraph it now 12. in paragraph 12. But this was, um, was this a meeting that, that I was at? Mm, you're copied into the minutes. So this is April 1981. Um, I, I don't know whether you had been at, at um, uh, any meetings mm. relating to it, but it, it, it's, it's a minute that's cc'd to you. No, um, I have no idea which bit of the existing management uh, was being deemed idiosyncratic. Don't worry then. But we can see in any event, April 1981, the, the clear... Um, steer is in, in support of a special health authority and just so that we can understand um, um, some of the difficulties of the temporary arrangements that had been put in place following the, the, mm -hmm. the Mr. disappearing out of the picture if we look at WITN 4461063 um, th this is a paper I don't think it, it's, a, it's, fact it's a ministerial submission um, I don't have a precise date for it but I'm sure we can check that bottom of the page so it, it sets out the, the, the history in terms of how it's been managed over the recent years. Um, and then paragraph five, bottom of the page, the chief difficulties over these temporary arrangements are that management is too diffuse with too many people exercising a fragmented responsibility. Management is insufficiently and not continuously coordinated at RHA, RHA level, so that's the North West Thames Regional Health Authority particularly. The task of management is largely in addition to the normal work of those who are carrying it out. Top of the next page, few of those responsible have any experience in the management of facilities such as the BPL, which is mainly a large-scale manufacturing plant, and responsibilities are vested in the department for which it's not equipped and which should in principle be elsewhere. The directors of the laboratories are not subject to the expert direction and monitoring which should apply. It's often difficult to reach fairly elementary policy decisions quickly and to ensure they're implemented. Pausing there, there might be said an element of the pot calling the kettle black, but in any event partly but not only because attention to the management of the laboratories has to be dropped from time to time in order to deal with other um, pressing matters. These problems will be even more acute now that we have to plan a new facility at Elstree. So uh, is that a fair, a fair summary of what the mm. concerns were about these, what were yes. only ever intended to be a temporary management system? Yes, I mean, neither the Department of Health, DHSS as was, or the North West Thames Regional Health Authority was... Uh, suitable as, as, a, as the definitive management structure and, and the sooner it could be replaced the better really. And, and that submission, I, I said it wasn't dated but it, it's probably the submission which accompanies the memo we looked at from April 1981. Um, in any event if we go to DHSC 302309 underscore 095 <coughs> DHSC 000, that's it, thank you. So this is um, dated the 29th of May 1981 um, from uh, Mr. Nodder. Uh, uh, um, and we can see bottom, it's copied to you. Mm -hmm. um, and then it sets out in the first paragraph um, reluctance to support a proposal for the creation of a special health authority, not simply because it's a new quango, um, but because it will inevitably mean increased overheads and hassle over composition, uncertainty about getting the right type of person. But careful consideration leads me to conclusion that we'd better advise ministers to go down this road than any other. Um, and so the bottom of that page, paragraph four, says subject to these observations, I, I support the submission. Um, so... Uh, I don't think we've got to hand the final ministerial decision, but we can see in any event the private office in May 1981 supporting it. Yes. Now, it's not until the 1st of December 1982 that the Special Health Authority, the Central Blood mm -hmm. Laboratories Authority, was established to take over management. Yes. Uh, do you have any idea as to why it took so long? No. And I think you... Were you directly involved in the process? No. Just, again, really 
looking at it from the perspective of with a degree of overview, do you think that period of what was ad hoc management effectively from 1978 through to December 1982 had any uh, impact or effect on um, either the way in which BPL operated or, or the process of planning for the future of BPL? Well, it was clearly not independent of government and therefore uh, had to have very much due regard to what was happening within the department. So uh, I suspect had there been, I don't know, of course, but had there been a, a more independent management structure, um, which had then the ability to make its representations very firmly to government, uh, to the department's ministers, that might have moved things on faster. But I don't think, as constituted, the Joint Management Committee was really in any position to make very strong representations to ministers that they were going to need to take very, very careful consideration of. Um, now, if we can then come on to the issue that I've referred to a couple of times already, and we've seen referred to in the documents, that, that the use of Scotland, yes. the, the Liberton plant, and, and whether uh, plasma for England and Wales could be fractionated in, yeah. in, in, in Scotland. Um, if we could look first of all at DHSC 0003715 um, it, it's a very faint document um, if we zoom in it's, it's just about it's just about um, legible um, it's from you, uh, if, and it's n November of 1979, um, and it's to Mr Harley. Note of a meeting held to discuss English plasma fractionation, fractionated by PFC Edinburgh. Now, th this is a, a specific issue about what to do with a volume of, 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 yes. um, of, of product. So it says, I met with Dr Lane on the 14th of November 1979 to discuss what was to be done with the 27,000 bottles of a PPF fractionated by PFC from English plasma, which were currently being stored at PFC. And then, to summarise, I think the next long paragraph, Dr Lane said this product was below BPL standards um, uh, and essentially contained impurities that could be a hazard to patients, so he didn't want to use it. Is that yes, right? Yes, that's right. Um, and, um, and if we look at the last sentence of that paragraph, he talks about his position at present in relation to the medicines inspectorate report is so vulnerable he cannot afford to issue to clinicians a product about which he has grounds for concern in relation to patient safety. Um, just in terms of what the product was that this is discussing, it's described as PPF. What was that? That will presumably be in pl plasma protein fraction, but BPL made plasma protein fraction. Um, Liberton made something which was called SPPS, I think, Stable uh, Plasma Protein Solution. The, the, these products were slightly different, uh, and the question was, I think, in, in this case, Dr. Lane concerned that the constitution of the Scottish uh, fractionated product was not one that he was comfortable with, my recollection is, I think, later on in this document that, that, that the um, Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service and Dr Cash, who was its medical director, was, was perfectly happy with the product and was perfectly happy to use it in Scotland. So we had a di di you know, difference of view. Um, on the one hand, Dr Lane feeling vulnerable because of the medicines inspectorate and so on, feeling that potentially this product had within it uh, an allergen or something which actually might cause adverse reactions in patients. He didn't want to take responsibility for this. It wasn't, as it were, his product because it had been manufactured in Scotland. The Scots saying, well, there's nothing wrong with this product, actually. We're happy with it. We'll use it. M this email, that oh, it's not an email, of course. <laughs> it's a minute that I wrote, was trying to say, look, the Scots are happy, the English not happy, why don't we just let the Scots have this product? Okay, we, uh, we're foregoing uh, a certain amount of, of um, 
of product for our own use, uh, but essentially let, let them have it if they're prepared to use it because basically we didn't want it to go to waste. And is it right to understand we're not talking about a factor eight concentrate? No, no, this is a... An, uh, yes, it's a, it's a plasma protein type product. It's, it's a sort of precursor of albumin. And if we just look further down the page under the heading opinion, um, it says this has been a rather unhappy experiment in which there have clearly been technical problems experienced in Scotland. The 20,000 litres of plasma were sent to Scotland in the first instance, not because they were surplus to BPL's fractionating capacity, but because BPL was having problems with its cold storage. Um, and um, in the last few lines of that paragraph, you say various technical lessons have been learnt from this venture. It remains to be determined whether PFC could, by their different method of fractionation, produce a product comparable to that produced by BPL. And then you say this, so this is the broader significance. This has fundamental implications for any future coordinated UK fractionation effort. Yeah. And then, as you say, I think if we look at the last few lines, the, the suggestion is, is to allow the Scots to use the product in Scotland, which they're apparently willing um, to do. Um, one of the questions I've been asked to raise with you, and it's perhaps a very understandable one given what's set out there, is why would it be regarded as acceptable for a product described as potentially hazardous for use in England and Wales to be administered or used for patients in Scotland? I really don't know. Uh, I don't think there was... I don't know what Dr Lane was really concerned about. It was clearly not a product he felt comfortable with, he was the responsible officer, if I can put it that way. Essentially, if something was wrong with the product, if anybody um, had an adverse reaction, it was then down to him, at least initially, even if in some way he could say, well, it wasn't me, it was Scotland. Uh, but he was uh, uneasy about it. Clearly, the Scots were not uneasy about it. And I thought that uh, the best way to resolve this was to actually let the Scots use a product that they were comfortable with. Um, and that indeed is what happened. I can't speak for Dr. Lane, and it's any amount of pity as I have been thinking all the way along this inquiry that Dr. Lane is not able to uh, represent himself here. Um, if we then um, move to the, the question, the, the bigger question that had been floated in Dr. Waiter's memo of August 1979 and in, and in your own um, uh, scheme in September 1979 of using uh, the Liberton to fractionate plasma for the purpose of producing factor eight yes. concentrate. Yes. Um, if we go to DHSC 5064 and we go to the second page, we can see these are the minutes of a meeting on the 1st of December with the Scottish Home and Health Department, the Department of Health and Social Services, Northern Ireland, and the Welsh Office to discuss UK self-sufficiency in blood and blood products. And then there are a number of attendees from the department, including you and um, uh, Mr Harley. We've got representatives from the Scottish Home and Health Department. We've got Dr Cash uh, and representatives from Northern Ireland um, and from Wales. Um, and if we go to the bottom of the page... Um, and we pick it up, uh, it, well, paragraph three records Dr. Cash talking about um, the possibility of a, a plasmapheresis program. And again, I might, we, may, we may come back to the question of plasmapheresis. Then paragraph four talks about Dr. Cash and Mr. McPherson saying PFC could fractionate an extra 500 litres of fresh frozen plasma uh, to produce factor eight and albumin. And ancillary staff needed to take on this extra work were available. And then five, uh, in the longer term, it was considered that PFC could cope with up to 1,500 litres per week, perhaps more, provided funds were made available and provided agreement could be reached on shift working. SSHD intended to give the go-ahead early in the new year to an experimental three- to four-week shift run to assess how the PFC would cope with the system. DHSS agreed that such an experiment would prove most useful. Yes. So t t first question, um, Dr Wolford, is are you able to assist us in understanding... Um, why, given the idea had certainly been mooted at least by August and, and September of 1979, that we're now in December of 1980, when it's really only that the appear to be concrete discussions to take it further forward? I can't say precisely why, but I think that it's fair to say, 
and again, it's trying to fix the dates here, but that the um, Dr. Dunning of the Science, Scientific and Technical Committee um, and the w was very keen that Scotland's uh, facilities should be should be exploited to the maximum of their ability. I think it's also true to say, actually, that there was a, a period in which we thought in that committee that the experiment for the shift working was imminent, and it kept being put back and back and back. And I don't think, but please correct me if I'm wrong, doing this from memory, that, that actually the shift working didn't get going till about the end of was it about November 1981? That's absolutely right, another year. Yes. Well, but people can understand that. I mean, why was it taking so long? It, uh, it was always on offer, but it never seemed to occur. And, and leaving aside the, the, the shift work experiment, which we'll, we'll come onto in a moment, was there ever any kind of um, assessment of uh, undertaken by the department, as far as you're aware, of the capacity of the Liberton plant to, to fractionate mm. um, for England and Wales? Well, the department wouldn't have been in any position to, to, to take, formulate that view. The whole point was that we needed to understand what was possible. I mean, the beauty of the, of the uh, Liberton plant was that it was purpose-built to do the continuous, uh, uh, continuous processing over a 24-hour period. It was, it was a much more state-of-the-art facility than the BPL. It had been built very much later, and it had been, we had England contributed £400,000 to its, to its building. So there was always the intention that it should be used, absolutely. Um, and uh, essentially, in order to work out what could be done, you did need to do this shift-working experiment. It wasn't being used in... in a continuous manner, which is what the, the facility had been built for. It was being used discontinuously. We can see from subsequent papers that a discontinuous process in a plant built for continuous process was, was inefficient and actually ended up with loss of product and so on. Um, so the, the, the issue is, well, let's have a look, see what can we, you had to do this experiment, uh, without which you really couldn't take a view as to what Scotland could do. Um, now, um it's right to note, I'm not going to go to all the documents, but, um, but we see in November 1981 the shift work experiment having finally taken place. Dr Lane appears to have had significant reservations about its success. Mm -hmm. um, and then if we can then pick the position up in December of 1981 with CBLA 00015171... This is, again, it's slightly faint in places, but it's a meeting of the policy steering group, of which you were um, a member, uh, uh, on the 18th of December 1981. Or, or you were part of the secretary, yes. I should say. And if we go to the second page, <coughs> we can see the heading towards the top of the page, Shift Work Experiment at PFC, Liberton. And then we have Mr Hibbert reporting he'd attended PFC as an observer during the shift work experiment. His general impressions were that PFC was capable of improvement. Its layout was not ideal. Its output might be increased if the present system were changed. It seemed less cost-effective than BPL, but it was planning to introduce a costing system. Uh, PFC hoped eventually to service the northern English regions. While Mr Hibbert did not expect the findings of the exercise to prove conclusively that continuous working would overcome the shortcomings of the existing system, the experiment had shown that the equipment could function on such a basis. Dr. Lane expressed some reservations about this experiment. He was particularly concerned that there appeared to be several inconsistencies in the information provided and that the study had examined mm. only one aspect of the production process. Mm. It was agreed that the BPL representative's report should be circulated to PSG members. And then we can see the next paragraph, the group, so it's the policy steering group, recognised the importance of a full exchange of information between PFC and BPL. A small working party might be required in order to ensure that the new BPL embodied the best aspects of both laboratories. In the meantime, it was essential to obtain a firm commitment from the Scottish Home and Health Department of the amount of plasma from England which PFC Liberton could fractionate. The group asked Mr Harley to press SHHD for this information as a matter of urgency. So we've got there, to some extent, a slightly mixed report. Mr Hibbert thinking it, it, it was reasonably successful, Dr Lane expressing some reservations. 
but the group want to know what um, really how it can be taken forward. Is that is that right? I think Mr. Hibbert was part of the BPL setup rather than, and yes. I and um, I have seen subsequent papers, so uh, I can, which you, which the inquiry has given me, so I can give a more rounded explanation. If yeah, yeah, you'd yes, like please, me to do that, please do because we'll we'll look at, at what Mr. Um, some of the correspondence and, and, and Harley between Mr. Harley and the Scottish Home and Health Department, but we've also provided you yes. with um, some notes by Mr. Watt yes. uh, uh, about uh, his mm. perception of, of how the shift work experiment mm -hmm. worked, and also a rather later letter from Dr. Cash saying yes. he thought it was something that was perfectly achievable. Yes. Um, we don't, I think, necessarily need to put those on screen. Mm -hmm. You've read them. Yes. First of all, did, as far as you can recall, did you or did the policy steering group receive those Scottish no. internal materials at no. the time? No, no. Um, and then if you can give that perhaps fuller explanation of what, what mm. your understanding yes. is. Well, to, to finish just on this particular document, I noticed that the policy steering group was absolutely clear, look, to sort this all out, we have to ask SHHD what's doable. I mean, there was, uh, it was well known that there was a difference of view between Dr. Lane and Dr. Watt. In fact, I should say differences of view between Dr. Lane and Dr. Watt on just about everything. Therefore, uh, I think it was felt that the best way of finding out what was doable and on what basis was to ask for a formal letter from SHHD. And that I've also seen, and, and undoubtedly, of course, it went to this committee. And I can short circuit things by saying what that letter from the Scottish Home and Health Department said was, well, we can obviously do quite a, uh, a lot in terms of the amount of fractionation we can do for the UK, but actually um, it's going to take uh, six to seven million pounds because we need to do extra building in order to be able to accommodate all this requirement, and it's going to take about two and a half years. So that was obviously a sort of bitter blow. If you like to think that you could reasonably easily use PFC, it clearly wasn't the case. And this was the formal letter from SHHD to the Department of Health saying, These are, this is the basis on which we can do it. Never mind any additional cost to um, the DHSS of, of, of uh, um, actually running a system through uh, in, in PFC. But th that was that. But I have also seen... Um, Mr. Wesley's report, which was, Mr. Wesley was a senior scientist in BPL, who has described in very, very um, moderate and, and, and perfectly reasonable terms, and I thought it seemed to me um, entirely, uh, entirely reasonable report, explaining what the successes were of the of the shift working system and what the downsides were. Now, the, the, the big problem with the downsides was that, that actually, although that they found they could make a product which would satisfy Dr. Lane in terms of the amount of albumin that was in it, so they, they were able to sort the chemical constitution out all right. Um, the way in which the, uh, the experiment had been run had three major flaws. One is that you couldn't make immunoglobulin running it in that way. You couldn't uh, actually um, make salt pore albumin, which was another important product. But there was no experiment to see how much factor eight you could produce. So that the, the main thrust of what we wanted to do was to produce um, factor eight concentrate at Liberton. Albumin was never really the big problem here. And actually, these Scottish experiment had not even started to tackle the potential to produce factor eight in, in any amount. They were just producing the normal amount of factor eight that they usually would produce for the needs of Scotland. So the, the experiment from that point of view didn't really help take matters forward, but what actually then probably put a stop to any further discussions was that there was going to be a cost of six to seven million pounds, avowedly so, because that's what SHHD said, uh, and it was going to take about two and a half years. If, if I'm just going to read out for the sake of the transcript the, the document references yes, for Mr. Watt's notes 
um, Dr. Cash's letter and um, um, and Mr. Wesley's um, 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 account. Um, but I'm not going to ask for any of them to go up on screen. So we've got SBTS four zero six one two underscore zero two six, SBTS four zero one eight seven underscore zero four seven, and CBLA three zero one five two eight. So anyone who who, who um, uh, wishes to um, uh, uh, um, in investigate that as, as one of the legal representatives can do so. Um, I, I just want to, before we finish on this topic, just deal with the exchange of correspondence, if we may. So between Mr Harley and, and the, the, the Scottish Home and Health Department. And if we look at CBLA 301532... Um, is this the letter yes. to which you were referring? Yes. So the 11th of January 1982. Um, it refers in the first paragraph to there having been a telephone um, discussion uh, and um, Mr Harley wanting an early response because he was due to be seeing Mr Finsberg, the minister. Um, then he says in paragraph two, I preface my remarks by mentioning two conditions which would have to be met before any progress can be made. First of all, I stress that although the shift working trial around the clock at PFC had been concluded satisfactorily, Staff cannot be expected to work in shifts regularly until an agreement on shift working has been concluded through the usual Whitley Council machinery. This, as you recognise when we spoke, was very much a matter for your colleagues on the Whitley Council side of DHSS to pursue. You indicated that the necessary action would be taken. Can you just assist us with understanding what that's referring to? Well, the Whitley Council was the um, negotiating body between um, NHS staff and, and management. So it was about negotiating terms. The, the, the contractual terms upon which staff would be employed. To, to work shifts, which was, of course, an unusual uh, employment um, method, if you like. Well, it was a pretty, pretty common employment method in factories at the time. Um, but I, I think it, it might have commanded a shift premium, presumably. Oh, absolutely would have commanded a shift premium. And I think that was one of the, one of the problems. And then if we look at the second paragraph, sorry, the third paragraph, the second precondition, as it were, I pointed out that the PFC Liberton could process substantial quantities of English plasma only if further ancillary facilities can be provided and that more land will be needed for the building required. Um, and, and then further explanation given in relation to that. Paragraph four, given that the obstacles referred to in the two previous paragraphs can be overcome, I do not think that the Common Services Agency Management Committee who are responsible for the PFC would raise any difficulties. And as we've indicated all along, we ourselves would be quite willing to have English plasma processed at Liberton. Um, and then paragraph five um, gives some further information about the, the, the potential as to what could be, could be processed in terms of plasma. Over the page, then I think we get the figure that you referred to. So paragraph six gives more details about expanding the ancillary facilities. Um, and the last sentence in, in what appears to be a darker print says we estimate that the total expenditure called for would be of the order of six to seven million we cannot give you a detailed breakdown breakdown of this at present and then if um, we get down to paragraph eight I think we see the assessment of the necessary building work being two and a half years it's the last sentence of paragraph eight um, and then there's a reference to providing more detailed information about the shift working trials. Um, um, we, we haven't given you every document relating to this because I think your involvement in it was, um, you were not a central no, part of the process. Right. Um, but do you know what, what happened after this? Because we see that in later meetings, we, we saw a reference to it earlier, Liberton's discounted for the purposes of planning for the redevelopment of BPL. Did, did this letter essentially bring the issue to an end, as far as you can recall? I think it must have done, because the, um, the uh, steering group for the redevelopment of BPL had said, the only way we can resolve this in terms is to ask SHHD what is doable. Uh, the letter is very clear from SHHD. They say what they can do, but they also um, indicate the constraints under which that might be done. And to wait two and a half years to see if this uh, would work out fine, and you can imagine, given the delays that we've already seen happen within, you know, 
uh, bureaucracies, this might have been longer than two and a half years, to spend six to seven million pounds on, on uh, getting uh, um, the Scottish plant up to speed, if you will, when you could be getting on with spending the money on a new plant for BPL, obviously can't have made very much sense to them. And I think this was probably deemed to be the definitive answer to whether or not we could make extensive use of, of the Scottish plant. Well, so we, we may be able to pick that up with further witnesses who were more closely involved than, than Dr. Wolfe with, with that decision making. Um, I, I note the time and I'm going to be moving on to a, a, a new topic after lunch, so a good point for a break, I think. Uh, yes, just, just one question, if I may, since we're on this topic at the moment. Uh, you've mentioned how uh, Mr. Lane uh, and Mr. Watt um, didn't see eye to eye on more or less anything. Uh, what were relationships like between uh, Mr. Lane and Mr. C Dr. Cash? Specifically, Dr. Cash. I don't think... I, I think they were not good. Uh, I really, we're in, it's a sort of privileged uh, environment we're in. Dr. Cash had a rather confrontational approach to almost everything. And therefore, um, it doesn't particularly surprise me that Dr. Lane, who was himself um, not the calmest of individuals, and Dr. Cash didn't necessarily get on. So they, they hit sparks off each other, did they? Yes, in a word. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, two o'clock. <laughs>